Strictly Come Dancing judge Craig Revel Horwood is about to head on the road with his debut solo tour. It's called All Balls and Glitter. <laughs> Come on! He'll be talking about his life from Australia to the West End to Strictly. I feel the need to channel Bruno at this point <laughs> in particular time. <laughs> Giovanni, darling! I think it's really important to be honest, number one, in life, and I know that comes across as sort of cruel brutality on a show like Strictly Come Dancing, but unfortunately, if you're not told the truth, then you're not going to improve, are you? And when it's to do with dance, of course, I'm very particular. But in real life, I mean, I have to deal with everything that other people deal with as well. You know, I, I don't just hold paddles from one to four, like I do on Strictly, you know. I am a director, a choreographer, you you know, an entertainer, a person that sings, dances and acts, you know, and I try and use all of that. You just mentioned all of those different jobs that you have done. When I talk about choreography with, with those uh, dance teachers, you know, they, they make a point of saying, the wonderful thing is you just see this moment come alive and that's the bit when you know you've got it. You've got it sorted yep. for a performance or a production. And maybe you could just spend some time with us talking us through what that's been like for you over the years, from those early days through to, to what you see now on the telly? Well, the scary thing for me starting out, not as a dancer so much as becoming a choreographer, making the transition between dance and being a dancer to choreography. They're two completely different things. Some people are great at dancing but don't have the necessary skill or artistic uh, integrity to become a choreographer because you have to think out of the box and you have to tell stories and you know as a dancer that's always applied to your body and then you bring that work or that body of work to life but as a director of choreography or a choreographer you need to see it in your mind's eye and then use the bodies in front of you to tell the story to the best potential that they can possibly be and that's probably why i'm quite hard on contestants because i'm hard on the dancers that i work with as well because i ask mm. them not only to invest physically but emotionally into everything that they do and as a director you're emotionally involved in the whole process so you've got to be in charge of everything, the huge arc of the story and make sure that that is told with absolute truth. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's what separates choreographers and director slash choreographers, you know, uh, how, how well you can be at storytelling, you know, how good you are at storytelling. I think that's the most important thing. Sometimes, you know, people, you, you kind of mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. sometimes people that as, see that as a kind of a directness, uh, which uh, uh, is seen as harsh. The reality is if you're doing those kind of jobs, if you're trying to get people to push themselves beyond yeah. the limits. Um, I remember talking recently before Christmas to Francesca Hayward, uh, the principal at the Royal Ballet, and she was saying, yeah. you know, you just need drive. In order to have yeah. drive, you need to be pushed. Yeah, that's so true. And uh, sometimes it's misconstrued as cruelty, but it's not. It's uh, cruel to be kind, in a way. And I think it's really important that you're told the truth, because then, you know, no Olympic champion is going to be, you know, held with kick gloves, are they? And, and you know, just eased through to the Olympic gold. You know, you have to be pushed, as you say, and you need to be told what's wrong in order to make it right, to make you a better a better athlete, and not only that, a better person, because it's uh, emotional as well as physical, like in, in every form of job or life. You know, a lot of CEOs go through the same thing. You know, they're directors in their own right, of course, in large companies, and hold a huge weight of responsibility, and they have to put on a show for the rest of the team, you know, and when they go home, they might kick back with a savvy bee, darling, put their feet up <laughs> and be themselves. And I want people to see that side of me, you know, the side that does put my feet up, that does, you know, kick back and relax and talk openly about stuff. I think it's really, really important. And plus, I wanted to sing because I love it and I never get an opportunity to do that. So, 
And that's something that I have a passion for ever since I was a little kid. And that's something I worked really hard on over my whole life, you know. And that's why I got into all the musicals I got into was because of my voice and the fact that I could um, dance as well and act. So it'd be nice to show a little bit of that off and just to introduce the audience to another me, another Craig Revel Hallward, you know, the one that they're not used to seeing on the television set every Saturday night. You know, here in Kent, we've just uh, been talking about the, the big plan uh, for from the Arts Council over the next 10 years mm. about how they look at uh, what they want people in communities to be able to do and being enjoy the creative arts. Are you pleased with what you see going on in, in towns and cities across the country, Craig? Uh, the, the fact that, you know, dance is very much still here alive in all of its different genres and forms. Yeah, I think Strictly Come Dancing has uh, an involvement in that because it is waving a big dance flag for the world, not only us here in the UK, but of course I do it, um, I do Dancing with the Stars New Zealand, Dancing with the Stars Australia and it, and it's and it's really prompted people to actually go out and have dance lessons you know it's given the layman an opportunity and a chance to experience what pro dancers went through when they were amateurs you know when they're doing it for passion not money you know when they were when they were doing it for the love for you know everything and it's i think it's brilliant exercise and that releases you know endorphins in the brain that is an instant natural happy pill you know and i think when people do go along to their first dance class yes of course they're going to be scared but i think you know once they get over the fear of it the excitement and then just the adrenaline starts pumping in their body and then they don't know themselves and they become different people and it'll make the world a happier place i promise you and it really has and there's been a dance explosion over the last uh, what, 15, 20 years because of yeah. Strictly, I think. You know, it's just put it in people's mind's eye. And you'll see people getting up that don't even think they can dance, get up and actually try it, which I think is good. You know, and, it's, and I think it's thanks to people like Anne Whittacombe who came on the show, people like John Sargent, you know, people that were willing to put themselves on the line and make fools of themselves in order to promote it in that way. And they acquired a love for it they didn't know they had and i think that's good too and as for setting up companies and community centers i think there's there's no better way of communicating than through your body in that way you know it really it de-stresses detoxes it does you know all good things and i think you know there's something to be said about that and it's like people going to drama class as well you can express emotions in different ways and use your emotions in that way that's useful and a tool and it makes you feel better about yourself and can answer some of your personal questions that you might be uh, you know alarmed about you know split up in relationships and all sorts of things you know you can go to an improvised acting class and get all of that out and use it you know for the better of not only yourself and well-being, but of everyone else around you. It's a really good point. And, uh, you know, even on the dance front, even my moves, Craig, you know, people are prepared to see. I I've got some shapes. Yeah. Well, any move is a dance move, no matter how bizarre <laughs> it might be. I mean, I have seen some pretty bizarre ballets, <laughs> you know, and it's uh, so it, it really is. I mean, any shape you create can be you know deemed as art so i don't think you know obviously strictly come dancing and ballroom latin have all very specific rules but you know they were devised those dancers those ballroom dancers were devised for people who were people that couldn't dance so they could dance together because that was the only dancing they did and of course when you went to the only socializing you did were at dance halls so you had to be able to dance in one way shape or form so they made it simplified so it's literally you know walking to music and then adding some shapes later i mean unlike classical ballet where you've got to go on point and you know obviously start at the age of three but uh ballroom and latin is for you know started as socially it didn't start competitively it was a social thing and uh, everyone had to learn to do it and people took class and that's where your fellas met you know the girls and mm. all of that stuff in the 50s you know but dance has been around since cavemen you know uh, dancing around fires for fertility and for rain and all sorts of things so it's in it's before people could speak they were moving uh, and communicating through movement before we even 
discovered language, you know, and that's why I think it's worked in 58 countries worldwide and in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most produced format in the world because uh, dance transcends any form of language. You know, you could go to Japan and not speak Japanese but still do a dance that everyone will know uh, and appreciate what it means. You know, I think that's what's brilliant about it. Craig River Horwood, thank you very much. Thank you, Dom.